Welcome to a special edition of Speed News. We're coming to you live here from Buttonwill Raceway Park. We're going to talk about the California Crown, the Western Endurance Racing Championship Round 4, and a really awesome wreck at Willow Springs. Welcome to Speed News, the National Autosport Association's video news magazine, with hosts Rob Kreider and John Lindsay, joined by an ever-changing group of NASA members and staff. Speed News keeps you up to date on all of the happenings around the NASA motorsports world. Because at NASA, we drive harder. Hello, we're coming to you live from Buttonwillow Raceway Park. I'm here with Ryan Flaherty and Will Falls of NASA. We're here for the California Crown weekend, and uh, I'm going to give it to Ryan Flaherty to talk about what that event is. So what we have, Ryan. Thanks, Rob. The California Crown event is something we put together as a special prize money race for both the Spec E30 and Spec Miata racers. A lot of the NorCal guys came down for a crossover race. They were gaining points for their Nor NorCal series as well. And we were fortunate enough to get a lot of sponsors on board. We have uh, the Spec Miata race was presented by Mothers, Polishes, Waxes, and Cleaners. And the Spec E30 race was presented by Midnight Oil Motors. We were fortunate enough to get a lot of uh, prize money and contingencies on board. The first place winner was uh, awarded $500 in cash money by trackhq.com. Second place winner got a AIM solo data acquisition system. And the third place winner won $150 to, towards weekendracer.com. Okay, with all those prizes on the line, definitely and some bragging rights as well. Uh, the racing was very, very, very close and definitely spirited, I would say. So I'm gonna throw it to Will Falls who watched the Specky 30 race and tell me how that thing went down, Will. Thanks, Rob. It was a very, very fun race to watch. We had 35 cars at the uh, standing start of the race, and everywhere you looked on the track, across the 35 cars, there was battles going on all over the place. Every single person from the top three cars having a breakaway and changing leads several times, all the way through the middle of the pack to the back of the pack, there wasn't a single car racing by itself. There was all kinds of action going on uh, throughout the entire field. You know, one of my favorite parts of that race was the standing start. I know that um, Charlie Hayes had the pole, but um, Larry uh, definitely got him at the start in the 12 car, and then uh, then the battle went on and on. So who ended up winning the race after the, all the battles were done? After everything was said and done, after a 45-minute battle to the finish, uh, Larry Frazier came across the finish line first with Charlie Hayes second and Brad McClure uh, in third. And it was hard-fought battle. All three of them swapped positions many times, and it was a very, very fun, exciting race to watch for the California Crown. And that was just half of the California Crown. We also had a Spec Miata race with the same cash prizes available to be won, and uh, we had a 16-car field. And Ryan, tell me about that race. How did it uh, shake out? The California Crown Spec Miata race was epic, as we expected. It was hard-fought battles for 40 minutes out there, lots of lean changes. It was pretty awesome racing. We got to say it was really, really clean. We did have an unfortunate incident that caused a uh, yellow flag right towards the end of the race. So under full course caution, the field got bunched up. And that's, you know, that's part of racing. You know, uh, the guys stretched the field out pretty good after the caution. They had to do a restart. And then uh, going into sunset, they had a little bit of a melee. So how did that shake out, Ryan? Yes, Rob. After the restart, it was certainly exciting. All the cars dashed into sunset. A little bit of side-to-side -side contact. Some lead changes happened. At the end of the race, we had David Dodge in third place. Second place was our teen Mazda driver, Scott Phillips. And first place winner was Rob Burgoon. It was a really, really great race. It was. It was a fantastic race. Really exciting to watch. I'd say the California Crown event was fantastic. You know, uh, drivers really make a difference out there in their uh, performance when they know that money's on the line. And uh, congratulations to NASA for putting on such a great event. So obviously, this is the first inaugural one. Are we going to have another one in the future, Ryan? I hope so, Rob. We definitely had great participation. It seemed like the drivers were happy and excited. We were able to get some uh, great sponsors on board, and we look forward to doing this again next year. And that'll take us to our next commercial break, and we're going to come back and talk about the Western Endurance Racing Championship, three-hour enduro at Buttonwillow. Welcome to another episode of Racing No Filter. Joining me in sunny California, Bill Wood, and down in sunny Florida, Peter Keene. 
We're gonna take a look at some of the products HPD has created for the 2012 Honda Civic. And specifically, we're gonna show you an install and adjustable sway bar. Until then, folks out there, you take care. Welcome back to Speed News. We have a new guest host with us here at Button Willow. We have Greg Gill, the VP of Marketing for NASA. Along my side, obviously, is uh, Ryan Flaherty. And we're here to talk about the three-hour enduro, the work race. I'm going to throw it to Ryan first, talk about what the Western Endurance Racing Championship is all about. And then we'll talk to uh, Greg, and he can show us what happened last night in the race. Yes, Rob. The Western Endurance Racing Championship is a six-stop endurance racing series that is both hosted in NorCal and SoCal for endurance racers in the West Coast. So with six different classes doing battle, there's a lot of differential speed. It makes for some very exciting stuff. Last night, the race started at 7.10 and went till 10.10 and put us into the darkness, which brings a whole new aspect to endurance racing, which is lights. So Greg, what'd you see out there? I'll tell you what, what an exciting race. This is a, our fourth installment on this race series. And I was, I was so impressed to see not only the daylight racing go well, and we had a little off track excursions we'll talk about in a few minutes, but on the same token, the class racing was impressive. The field, we really got by with some very, very few uh, cautions. It was, it was just an impressive race from, from start to finish. But what was really interesting was to see the, the type of cars that ended up at the top of the podium. That was a surprise, I think, to a lot of us. When you had what we might call a, a big money car in the Porsche from True Speed, it was, it was a, it, they did an epic battle. Uh, came from a, a off-track excursion that dropped them down, I think, as far as almost 29th. They ended up third by the time they were done. But the story with two E0 cars running at first and second, now that was something. When you look at the separation between them and the Porsche of only six one hundredths, what a race. It was uh, quite an experience. So that's one of the exciting things about the work series. You have the multi-class portion of it. So you'll have uh, Miatas out there that are worth probably, what do you think, Ryan, less than five grand. And you have a very, very expensive Porsche. And they're mixing it up door to door out there. So Ryan, you were actually in the race last night. And what was it like from the uh, driver's perspective? Absolutely, Rob. The cool thing about endurance racing is you have all these different cars. Last night we had uh, more than 30 cars take the green, and you do. You have a wide mix of variety of cars, so you get constant passing, constant traffic navigation. I got to see your car out there quite a bit. You and I swapped positions, had a great time out there. So, uh, you know, I mean, that's what it's about, getting behind the wheel, dialing in, getting comfortable, three hours, going into the nighttime. Endurance racing is just an incredible experience. You've got the team component. You've got to do pit stops. You have to do fueling. If you, do, uh, if you do a bad job in the pitch, you get hurt from that. You definitely get uh, some positions subtracted if you don't have a top-notch team helping you out in the pitch. There's some penalties involved if you have some fuel spills or speed in the, in the pitch. So uh, really, really dynamic kind of racing, and uh, it's just an incredible experience out there. You know, Ryan brings up a very important part in really in endurance racing. You have to have a good crew because it would be a very long pit stop if you have to park the car, get out of your five-point harness, and fill the car with gas yourself. So having friends is a good thing. So, Greg, what did you see as far as in the pits themselves? Any kind of uh, drama there? Rob, you can't talk about having endurance racing without having drama. Uh, we, we saw from the very well-prepared teams to, as you say, people who had their friends with them. And the, the big issue was everyone watching to be sure on, on fuel spills and safety. And as Ryan mentioned, we did have a few people that picked up some five-minute penalties for some light spills. But again, it was, it was a fairly smooth race compared to ones that we'd had here earlier. Uh, teams seemed to have really been working in sync. Uh, they were getting good information from them, the tower and from control. And overall, we had a fairly smooth, uneventful, and that's what you want to have in any of these situations is uneventful time in the pits. Uh, there was some extra team effort, people getting the cars out, and a few changes on some things that were picked up on track, uh, pulled back in. But uh, overall, pretty smooth time in the pits. Yeah, at the end of the run, third place was the G22 Racing True Speed Porsche, followed by the TC Design E0 BMW in second. And on the top of the podium, the Pure Performance E0 BMW. It was a great race. Thanks, Greg, for listing out our top three finishers. And what should be noted is, after three hours of night racing, there was only 14 seconds between the second place car and the first place car. That is incredible. What a great series we have. That's going to wrap it up for us here at Buttonwill. Now we're going to head to the studio to talk about an American iron crash that happened at Willow Springs. State your desires. Speed. Adrenaline. Competition. Calculating. Result in three, two, one.
National Auto Source Association. Start here. Welcome back to NASA Speed News. Now, uh, racing is a lot of fun, but sometimes things can get a little bit dicey. Sometimes you can get upside down. And uh, Ryan, you have a crazy video from the American Iron Class over there at Willow Springs. Why don't you tell us about it? Yeah, we, we had a spectacular crash at the May event at Willow Springs, and we were very fortunate. It's one of those unique instances where we uh, were lucky enough to get photos as it was happening from the outside perspective, as well as uh, looking at some in-car video. So what I'd like to do is show some of the outside pictures and uh, get our audience familiar with uh, what something like this might actually look like. So the first video you can look at, this is the classic, the car is uh, dropping wheels off track and going through the dirt. The next photo here is we see uh, the car impact with a berm that is off track and immediately get airborne. Now, I'd like to call attention to the green wall that is in the background. That's approximately eight to nine feet higher than the actual surface of the ground. So, for all of us that uh, really enjoyed watching the Dukes of Hazard when we were young, I mean, this AIX car is uh, definitely up there putting the general, general lead to shame. So, he's airborne at that point, uh, which at that point, the car goes into a roll, continues its flip, and then you can see uh, in the background the car hits the concrete wall, landing on its roof, bounces off of the wall here, and you can see this final picture where it finally comes to a rest. And here's a shot of the actual concrete wall itself that took out uh, I don't know, seven, eight feet worth of uh, concrete reinforced center block with rebar in it. So it was, uh, it was something to be seen. It was quite amazing. I had a sinking feeling in my stomach and uh, fortunately, you know, in all of these things, uh, driver safety is our paramount concern and we're very fortunate that Steve Butcher was okay. Now, you, Ryan, you said you had some in-car video of this as well, so let's go ahead and take a look at that and uh, walk us through what it was like from the driver's perspective. Okay, so uh, we'll start our video here and look at uh, Willow Springs, known as the fastest row of the West. We're going over turn six, basically flat on the gas, gaining speed. This is one of our high-powered AIX cars driven by Steve Butcher, and he's getting ready to turn into turn eight right now, which is very high speed turn, he's probably doing uh, well in excess, 135, close to 140 miles an hour. He drops the wheel, no big deal, tries to bring it back on track, boop, in the dirt, sucks him off, gets ready, hits the berm here, boom, airborne, can't see, that's that silence that everybody's scared about, boom, car flips, comes to uh, a sand sill, driver is remaining calm, pops his window net off, exits the car, checks himself out and uh, removes himself from the proximity of the car. So now we have a, uh, an interview that was taken by Brian Rogers from Agent 47 that uh, spends a few moments with Steve to recount his experience during that event. So let's listen in and see what they have to say as well. You flew a total of 70 feet. In the car, it didn't seem like you went very far. You know, you just, you're up and you roll and it's, it's over instantly. I mean, it's a perfect 10 textbook exit. You did exactly what you guys are constantly drilled on to see how fast you can get out of the car in case of an emergency. And Steve, you performed with flying colors, literally flying colors. I got to tell you guys, that's an absolutely amazing video. I've never seen one where, if you look at it, the camera flies out of the car and does a perfect capture of Steve getting out of that car. I timed it, he did it in nine seconds, and having his bell rung that hard and getting out in nine seconds, that's really something. Uh, I did a similar flip in my little Nissan Sentra, and it took me much longer to get out because I was so goofed up and trying to figure out where I was, I didn't have nearly the presence of mind that he did. So, an amazing video, I think that's uh, the old, yeah doc, that was a one in a million shot, so that's a, really cool video to see and it's even cooler to see that Steve got out walking around and then see the interview with him and Brian he's just fine amazing stuff Rob amazing stuff the odds of that camera landing exactly where it did I almost thought that I didn't realize that's what happened when I first saw the video I thought 
someone got there and took the shot. I realized like, I'm not watching a, a Bruckheimer film here. That thing actually just landed in the dirt there. I mean, it's incredible. So uh, now Ryan, you had a chance to look at the car after the crash. How did the uh, safety equipment work out in this particular incident? You know, I, I have to give credit to Steve Butcher. He's an expert craftsman and built this car from the ground up. And the first thing I noticed about the car was the, uh, the roll cage was just superior to most things that I've seen. And let's look at some photos of the car that you can see here from the outside. The car is absolutely destroyed. But the cockpit area is very well protected. I mean, everything, uh, there's a lot of distance uh, that still remains in the roll cage. The cage is stitched to the chassis of the car. And for the amount of forces and impact that happened, the car survived unbelievably well. You can see the impact that the car suffered. This thing's never going to race AIX again, but um, <laughs> you know, a testament to the roll cage. You can see here the photo from the side view, the amount of forces that goes on. Now, I'd like to call particular attention. Look at the foot box. Here is a picture of the foot box, and you can see the amount of intrusion that happened based on the forces that the engine or something's pushing back into the foot box. Now, the final photo that I want to show you is take particular note of the added bar that is connecting to the A-pillar down tube that is going along the bottom of that A-tube out to the firewall. And if you look at it, you can see that firewall is completely intact from the clutch pedal uh, forward to the firewall whereas the firewall portion closest to the transmission tunnel is completely crushed in. And oftentimes we do see injuries to driver's feet in crashes such as this. But this tells you that when you take that little extra attention to detail, put specific gussets, weld the cage to the chassis, and put in strategically placed tubes, all of this stuff really adds up to deliver quite impressive protection level for the driver. What do you think, John? I got to get to the welder and we got to start welding some new bars in our cars or what? I think so, Rob. I uh, have some pretty big feet and it would uh, stink to get them all busted up in a crash. And that wraps up our episode here of Speed News. If you want to send in your video to be part of the GoPro Hero Move of the Month, send that video link to speednews at drivenasa.com. Thank you very much, Ryan. Thank you, John. And we'll see you next month here on goracingtv.com.